Hey, that's right. You know the goddamn deal. Episode 233 of the JB and Money Making Mitch review. Oh my god, you see who's with me, the guy himself. Money making Mitch stepping in here for Dr. Jeremy Bridges, who was in San Diego. He will be back here with us next week. We got a whole lot of shit to talk about, baby. Finally getting around to some state of the Burr gang first quarter of the Arizona Cardinals season. But in the meantime, if you just have it in for the first time, please make sure to follow us at JB and Benny Blue. We're posting all original content, clips from the podcast and live stream that you may have missed. And make sure to subscribe on YouTube for content as well uh follow us individually follow jb at 73 king jb 73 and follow yours truly at benny blue eyes of course we're on tiktok at jb and benny blue you know the deal casual sports family is in the building tonight including our guy who's reporting live from the phoenix suns preseason game we're going to bring him out in just a moment casual sports.com where you can see mitch's writing coverage on the cardinals the, the diamondbacks the suns and ASU, everything in between there out in the desert, live streaming radio out of Phoenix. And listen, if you still want our podcast, as JB said, one hot dollar. Give Mitch a theme music, Will. Give him this if you smell what Mitch is cooking, God damn it. That's right. You tell him. Well, you know, we love you to death. Uh, subscribe. There's one hot dollar. Patreon.com forward slash JB and Benny Blue. Listen, BG fans, you know the season's been topsy-turvy, but please make sure to represent your crew get 10% off your order for our Burr Gang all day unisex t-shirt using code BG at checkout jbandbangblereview.com forward slash store. Uh, if you missed JB last night, he had a great one. Burning Bridges live streaming on Twitter. AAT Sports underscore at All About the Birds as well. Shout out to our All About the Birds family there out of Philly. Uh, they're live streaming Tuesday night. So if you missed it, you can go do our Twitter again. It's at JB and Benny Blue. We reposted that right there so you guys can uh, check that out. And again, sponsorship, interviews, new music, hate mail, get at us. JB and Benny Blue Review at gmail.com. And some quick business here, of course, our young boys out of the desert. Shout out to Valley Boys Association Clothing. Go to valleyboysassociation.com and use code PODCAST22 for 20% off your order at checkout. And our guy, it's timdubai.com. If you need your new or pre-owned vehicle of your dreams, text REVIEW to 515-444-7003 or DM him at it's Tim Dubai on Instagram. And again, coming up, going to talk some Cardinals, some Week 5 recap, the roughing the passer madness, the fucking analytics going for fourth down. I know Mitch has a lot to say about that. And, of course, making our Week 6 Savage picks. But, uh, Dr. Hughes, uh, how, how, are you, how are you feeling in general, sir? And how did you feel about this last week of NFL foosball, good sir? Well, you know me. When the Titans win, I feel great. So I feel great. That's how I feel. Well, your man had over 100 yards and two TDs, so we are For the 30th to time in his career, he has over 100 rushing yards. Who's counting? Who's, who's counting, counting, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about it. We're definitely going to talk about We're going to talk about my uh, uh, in-the-cellar kitties who, thank Christ, they have a goddamn bye week this week. Good God almighty. But damn it, we are not going to belabor the point anymore. We are bringing him on. He is out there covering the Suns right now for the preseason. He's our guy, the one, the only, our fearless leader, Mr. Casually Earl Burnett, baby. Woo! That's right, sir. How are you doing? If we can get his stream to low, because Lord knows he doesn't have Wi-Fi. He is somewhere in the bowels of the stadium. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you see us, sir? Young Casual Lee. Uh-oh. Is this going to work? It might be one of those streams, folks. Is Casual Lee currently in that basement that I was in in Yellowstone where it yeah, was like I was in a dungeon and I had no internet? <laughs> I know exactly. I th I think Earl is joining us live from uh from uh Iran or something because he's he's looking like an Al Jazeera hostage video. Uh, all right, Earl, I'm gonna pull you out. We're gonna bring you back here in a second. But damn it, we got to get into some state of the Burr gang. We're gonna talk about the Arizona Cardinals here uh right now, and then we're gonna try to bring back in Earl when he gets um some better Wi-Fi or whatever the hell he has to do to join us here. But Mitch and I were joking about this in our patented production meeting. Um. It's funny when you have two absolutely not Arizona Cardinals fans talking about the Arizona Cardinals because Sean's not available, JB's gone, Earl apparently has Metro PCS. I don't know what the hell's going on. So it's me and Mitch. So 
Mitch, um, just jump, start kicking it off right now. And we'll try to bring back an Earl because I see he's bringing it back on the stream. What is your grade for the Cardinals for the first quarter of the 2022 season? Good, sir. First off, would Jay, like, I love JB. And I love Jay, who is supposed to be on here. JB would have helped. But would have Jay really have helped with the Raiders fan? We would have had Raiders, Lions, and Titans talking about the state of the bird gang. That would have been piling on. one of the greatest things. <laughs> um... I would say it's kind of what we expected. Like, this wasn't the easiest of the beginning of the schedules, especially because Philadelphia, the most unexpected part, Philadelphia is better than we thought they were, or I thought they were. Um, but they've stayed close against Philadelphia, which gives me a lot more hope. It came down to a kick, which could have brought them to overtime, and it came down to a fourth down 13 conversion or something like that, where Zach Ertz caught a 16-yard ball. Like, that's something that could easily be fixed. It's just the bounce of the ball changes the entire game. Um, I still think they're a good a good team that's had, that needs to figure out a better identity, but kind of has had some down slopes right now. I think they're better than they're playing. I'll give them a C with potential of going higher by the end of the year, though. I like that. I was going to say C plus or B minus. The interesting thing, and I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago, is like they're almost like inverting their season where these past couple of years they with, you know, with Cliff, they've really started hot in mm -hmm. the September and October months, whereas they're kind of, you know, they're kind of in a weird thing. They, they open the season with a, a pretty convincing loss at home to the Chiefs. Then they go on the road. You know, uh, they just they, all they've been doing this season is trading wins and losses. L W L W L. And then they're going to be at the Seahawks here. So we're going to get to that here toward the end of the segment. But there's clearly something going on still with the whole Cliff Kyler thing. The, the homework clause need to get put back in the contract. They just cut Max Williams, which I would love to have someone who's more expertise. I'm guessing to probably make a roster spot for another need. Um, everybody has injuries. I know JJ Watt had to have like a fucking defibrillator to bring him back to life, whatever the hell happened. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I would say, and honestly, I don't know who's really stepping up for them. Um, to make plays on defense either. I mean, they can establish stuff in the run game. They're going to get D-Hop back here because it's the six-game suspension. Um, but I think they're really kind of, they're kind of middling right now, in my opinion. Do you think that's like a fair assessment? They're just kind of middling at this point? Yeah, I think they have top-notch talent on their team and they're being 500. Now, that being said, in the NFL, anyone can beat anybody any week. Like, we saw that one year where the Browns, I think it was, were 0-15, and, and the Chargers were fighting for a playoff spot, and the Browns beat them and went 1-15, and, and everyone celebrated because they didn't go 0-16. Um, any team could be anybody, and it always comes down to just execution and just a bounce of a ball every single game, and those bounces have not gone their way by any means. So, but they are middling. They can't create more bounce potentials that they haven't created, but... Um, I just think this is a team that needs to figure out who they are at this point. They, Cliff isn't helping them with that. Yeah, and it's interesting. JB called me after the game, and he was at the game doing the you know doing the alumni thing, you know, shaking mm -hmm. hands, kissing baby, signing autographs, taking some pictures. And I told him like, you know, they even acknowledged this before the you know the replacement kicker because Prater was out. Uh, Amendola went to kick it. He kicked the way he missed it was the exact same way he missed it in warmups, where. He aimed for the middle and it hooked right where he should have aimed for the left and would have hooked center. Right. And he did the exact same thing he did in warm ups and they fucked it up. And, you know, Prater, I love Prater. He's the town drunk. He's he was the, he was an awesome kicker for the kiddies. I, I guess I don't blame him for not re-signing in Detroit, but at the same time he was hurt and they had to replace the kicker. And like you said, that was kind of a ball bounce game because they played a very sound team eh, fairly well. Like it wasn't perfect, but they hung around. So that was certainly a, you know, a winnable game, but kind of what I mentioned, you know, going back to like what um, I was saying with how they were trading wins and losses, they really are the regular season road warriors. They're nine and one in their last 10 away games, but they're two and eight in the last 10 home games. Um, I've been to Cardinals games. I've been to a few at this point. I'm not sure if, if you've, you've been to any, you've been to any recently, but they they have a weird they i don't know like jb tries to fight for this we were talking about our production meeting what jb tries to fight for with the cardinals and one thing he tries to fight for that i can objectively say is not there 
is really a true home field advantage. Not that uh, that always really means anything in football. Like I get, I think I think it does help. Like a team like the Chiefs, for example, there can be a little nudge there. But mm-hmm. w- when you see that, just that kind of stark numbers, like. Do you have any theories as to why this is the way it is for them? Is it just because they're like they're gonna have a game in Arizona when they play the Cowboys and it's gonna be seventy five percent Cowboys fans? I mean, what's the deal with, that, with them at home? This is crazy. So I have a couple theories. One, I I right. had I had two season tickets or two season tickets for two years. Uh, oh. One was the Josh Rosen year. One was Kyler's rookie season year. Oof. Um. But a lot of people from Arizona move from Chicago, Vegas, yeah, transplant Wisconsin, that. anywhere cold. So when I went to the Chicago Bears game, I swear it was seventy percent Bears. When I went to the Pittsburgh game, we saw the pictures. It was 80, 90 percent Pittsburgh. All these cold, cold place teams come down to Arizona, and it's a tourist attraction down here. So that's why we don't have a true home field. Is because all these people keep moving down here. And then there's more of their fans when they're, I don't know, 12 and 4 than when the Cardinals are 9 and 8. True. And I mean, because it is a transplant town similar to L.A., although the Rams actually, to I think to a lot of surprise from outsiders, actually have a fairly established fan base, albeit because like- of the Super Bowl. Like, when was the last Super Bowl here? <laughs> Yeah, but you gotta understand there's a, there's also a lot of people who like grew up in like Orange County and different kind of parts of Southern California that um actually were with the Rams back in the Eric Dickerson's day and said, Yeah, Will, I mean you, you lived there you lived in, in the Phoenix area for many years. You already know it's kind of a transit state, transit city. So yeah, I mean that that makes sense. But even still, it's like it is so strange to me how they really don't get the job done at home and I really don't understand why I wonder if there's like any da- any data or metric to support why the hell it's like this for them why they just can't maintain a level of consistency from home and away usually it'd be the other way around for both teams but i don't know it's a it's a it's a mystery not to be solved i guess by a titans fan and a lions fan but i also um i was listening to amino hassan who is ex gm of or ex president of the suns back in the day yep. Yep. and he was saying and it's a good point phoenix when the cardinals came here they were playing at asu stadium it took them forever to get their feet off the ground they weren't really good when they came over here all that the suns is kind of where phoenix lives like when the suns are good people show up for that compared to when the cardinals are whereas most towns it's an nfl town we're an nba town at the end of the day sure and so that could be drawing a lot of where it is is just the history of this team yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see if they're able to kind of break that trend, you know, going forward here in the second half of the season. Um, Cliff Kyler connection, connection with the K, fun times. Did Cliff tell Kyler to spike the ball after he slid short against the Eagles? Because I think that happened. Um, Ky- Kyler definitely slid short. So, yeah, like what the hell... What what is going on with them? What the hell? What the hell? What the hell are so, we doing? So the answer is yes, he did do that. Um, I wonder if, due to the angle of what Cliff was seeing when he first told him to spike the ball, I wonder if he thought he slid later, because when you're looking at the line, you're going to be looking at it diagonally, and that's the only thing that makes sense to me because he definitely told him to. Also, it reminds me of when Kirk Cousins went to almost halftime. And he went and uh, kneeled the ball instead of spiked the ball to go into when he needed to spike it for the field goal. That's what it reminded me of. Right. Right. So ending sequence, second down, Kyler slides a yard short of the first down. Third down, as we're showing here on the video, if you can see it on the screen, he spikes it with 22 seconds left. And then it's fourth and one. And then that's when this guy, Amadola, who, by the way, let the record show, Mitch, when I was talking to JB on the phone when he was leaving the stadium after the game, legitimately thought they signed Danny Amendola <laughs> to, to I, kick real goals. When I, I thought that. So I was at work for uh, part of it and then like listening to it on the radio and watching it. And then I, I was talking to my boss and I was looking at the ESPN app and it said Amendola's kicking. And I was like, are right. we at our emergency kicker where Danny Amendola is <laughs> still in the league kicking the ball? Because that's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I swear to God, I was like, who's like, are they just going to get Julian Element on retirement or just like mule fucking just pooch, pooch punt after safety? Like, what are we even doing? All right. Oh, my God. K 
Ca our guy Casual Lee is is desperately trying to, to join the stream, but he I don't, Phoenix Suns. Do you just have like? Do you just not have like five G? Like what? What the hell's going on at your stadium? Um, so yeah, Cliff and Kyler. I mean, they need to figure it out going forward, or else this season is very kind of teetering. You know, like we said, we're kind of middling. But Mitch, they might get some relief. Uh, D Hop D Day. DeAndre Hopkins is coming back. Um, you know, they're trying to get to Hollywood Brown. They're doing some design stuff for Rondell Moore. And then beyond that, you know, trying to establish run game with Connor. I mean, Ertz is probably their best, you know, maybe their best guy up to now in terms of this, particularly with like a safety blanket for Kyler. So, you know, how do you see DeAndre Hopkins kind of affecting their offense, you know, coming off this like six game suspension? Um, comfortability for sure. If your number two can't be a number one and he's being a number one, you don't feel comfortable with that. Like at the end of the day, Earth is still going to be your safety blanket, but also you can take shots with Brown and you can look at Hopkins first. So Brown is now your risk. Earth is your super safe. And then Hopkins is your force. So it's just more connection for Kyler. It's more weapons and it's more comfortability. I think the biggest issue um, that we've seen, I think particularly with Kyler, and it's I think it's more to do with Kyler than it is with Cliff, is like you've seen kind of what he does with his reads and his decision making. And yeah, I mean, you know, Hollywood Brown does the, does have the ability to somewhat take the top off, but at the end of the day, I'm not looking at someone like him to be available for like that big post route, that big one on one ball that Hopkins could dip, particularly if they're trying to do something in the end zone where you're talking like a true situational matchup where D Hop can, can essentially moss somebody. Cause I mean, that's kind of what he's good for. Um, I mean, they're getting whatever's left out of AJ green, I guess. Um, but I don't think even, even still, I don't even think the back shoulder fade is going to, you know, work with him at this point in his career. So I'm definitely curious to see if that allows Kyler to keep his eyes downfield and not like blatantly miss uh, things that are going to be right in front of him. Um, Cause I mean, you know, they, they need it because he I've seen on film already in several games. Now he's missing guys that are wide open and he wants to do like the, he wants to do the Oklahoma gunslinger thing. It's like, that's all well and good if you have somebody down there, but a lot of times he doesn't have anybody down there. So definitely curious to see how that, uh, you know, opens him up. Um, speaking about getting guys back, maybe this answer is obvious, but which Cardinals player on the currently on the injured list do you think is most needed immediately? Like, who do they really need to be like, we have to have this guy healthy? Um, it's not on the injured list, but DeAndre Hopkins. <laughs> like, he's the most they need back. Like, that's it. That's what they need. I mean, if when I'm looking at, I'm looking at from what they have now, Daryl Williams, doubtful. Jonathan Ward's on injured reserve. Matt Prater's doubtful. Oh, no, uh, yeah. No, Prater's a good one to have. We just saw yeah. that. Prater's yeah. probably up there. Connor's got a rib. Uh, Connor has a rib injury. Apparently, he wasn't in Wednesday walkthroughs. And then O line, they're fucked up. Uh, DJ Humphreys is questionable. Justin Pugh's questionable. And Sean Harlow's questionable. So I think the obvious answer is I think the obvious answer is Prater. But I think they're actually going to be in a world of trouble if like Connor has to. Um, I think if Connor has to miss this week. They might fuck around and lose to the, to the Squawks because they're playing in Seattle. You know what I mean? Because if they're not able to really truly establish that run game with it, with Ward already in the IR, and then they're already in depth in terms of Daryl Williams, I mean, it's like, eh, I don't know. He might be the other key guy besides Prater because obviously they Prater could be the difference between a win and a loss in a close game. That much we know. Yeah, I'm not too worried about James Conner, and I'm not too worried about this game for a couple of reasons. One, historically, Cardinals beat Seattle in Seattle. And two, you brought up the stat. They're 8-2 and two away. Like, the stat's kind of... Pardon like, me, 9-1. 9-1, and one. Nine and one, my bad. 9-1. They're 2-8 and eight at home, 9-1 and one away. Um, but I'm not too worried about this, whether James Conner really plays or not. He... I'm not his biggest fan by any means. Um, I don't have the most faith on him in a consistency standpoint. So I think he's pretty low on that list, especially when we're talking about O-line missing. Um, I think the O-line is sure. way more important than him. 
True, because he he's definitely a running back that needs to benefit from the O line rather than yes. like if they had Derrick Henry back there, like we could be blocking for him and he'll find a way. You know what I mean? Like maybe please don't put me out there, coach. Please don't put me out there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's not getting one oh six and and two TDs when you're if if Mitchell Hughes is the pulling guard, but you know, he'll just jump right over you. Um right. so be cool. I'm just going straight down and like kind of hurtling down to like try tripping them that's all i'm doing right they're like are you chop blocking you're like no i'm literally falling over to take myself no i'm i'm in a i'm in a ball crying like what do you mean chop blocking (laughs) oh my god hey speaking of being in a ball crying it's the bird gang's next four games so i've switched up a little bit this time mitch as you see on state of the bird gang we're gonna do a little bit different so you said at the squawks at seattle win loss or coin toss what 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 do you think is happening Oh, I love the next four games in general for the Cardinals. I think this one's going to be a win, and it's going to start a win streak. Spoiler alert. I do think it's uh, I think it's going to be a win, because like you said, the uh, road record. And um, yeah, I like them getting the most out of D-Hop coming back. I mean, he's going to be, con- he's going to be coming back motivated, so he's going to be playing with extra vigor. So I like them going to Seattle and getting the win. All right. Hosting the Saints, win loss or coin toss? So here's a little caveat. They're at home, which kind of stinks, but it's Thursday night. So Saints do not have as much time to prep and they have to come to Arizona after their game. Um, when you're home and you're Thursday, I'm always going to bet on you. I say they win that game. I think it's a coin toss. I think it goes either way. I could see, I could see them winning convincingly. I could see them letting the Saints hang around. And fucking it up, to be honest with you. I mean, just and that's just like you said, Thursday night, I get it's at home. But also, the Saints can be dynamic enough on offense and may be able to get Kyler enough out of his rhythm on defense to actually steal one. I mean, if they were in New Orleans, I honestly would probably, just based on trend, probably pick the Cardinals. So I'm not, I don't, I'm going coin toss in this. I think, I think this one's either way. All right. At the Skull Vikings, win loss or coin toss? So this one's away after the Thursday game. So they get right. Sean Wentz is going back too. Shout out to Taysom Hill, baby. The Mormon (laughs) Swiss Army knife. Anyway, continue. So away after the Thursday game. So they get extra rest and everything. So that helps. Um, I'm going to say they win that game also. Man, this one's really tough. I'm going to say... I think Unless lose. Vikings are on by the week before. If Vikings are on by the week before, I say Vikings win, but I think they lose. I, th- I can see it. I think the I think the, the Vikings are, are more balanced, are gonna are gonna, are gonna play more mistake free ball. Um I know it's not on trend for the for the BG, but I think they're gonna go in there and lose. And then hosting the uh, squawks, win loss or coin toss? Loss. I think they actually win. I think I think they actually went at home. Look at me just being a fucking contrarian. Like you came up with the nine and one stat, and then you just totally go against it on that. <laughs> yeah, but you 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 also you also have to count on. Sometimes you just have to count on the time of the year, right? Because I think I think the squawks have been have been kind of out kicking their coverage in terms of talent. Um, but I think at this point, I do think the BG are starting to get it together and they get one at home so there you go uh that has been um some state of the blade gang ladies and gentlemen casual e is trying to join us again on his terrible phoenix suns wi-fi no shade to the suns we love you but get your wi-fi together uh but in the meantime let's pay some bills god damn it all right tap in with our young boys that's valleyboysassociation.com use code podcast 22 for 20 percent off your order at checkout and of course, get at our guy. It's Tim to buy.com. Get your new pre-owned vehicle. Text review to 515-444-7003 or DM him at it's Tim to buy on Instagram. And he will get you into the car of your dreams no matter where you're at in this fine country. All right. And again, BG fans, we were just talking about you. Get your Bird Gang All Day shirt. Use code BG at checkout. Get 10% off jbandbandlereview.com forward slash store. Uh, we got some savage reactions to some music coming this week. We're done it this week if JB was on, but we're going to do it next week. So if you're an artist and you want us to live react to your music, you can send us original music against sponsorship inquiries, interview inquiries, hate mail, titties, whatever you got. JB, I'm sending the titty pics 
to Mitchell because he's in the middle of nowhere. JB and Benny <laughs> Review at gmail.com. And again, we live stream Wednesday, 7.30, 7.45-ish Pacific time. That's 10.30, 10.45 Eastern time. And again, follow us at JB and Benny Blue Review on all social media. All right, man. We got to get into some week five recap. We're going to see if we can try to bring Earl in on this. Uh, but first, we got to talk about young Mitch's Titans. That's right. Titan of Woo! Titans. They beat the Commanders 21-7. Derrick Henry, 102 yards and two TD. Whoa, whoa, no, no. That was 21-20. What do you, what do you, wait, 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 what happened? Really? Um, Titans beat them 21-20. Did they really? I'm yeah. fact-checking you on this. It was horrible. I listened to it and watched it. It was horrible. Well, regardless, your fucking Titans won. Tell me tell me about the game. What happened? Um, 21-17. It's 21-17. Oh, 17, my bad. Um, okay, so pretty much what happened was... Titans did what they do. What they do, they score points in the first half. They struggled to move the ball in the second half. Derrick Henry, definitely 30th game, over 100 yards, rushing, not even catching the ball. Who Derrick Henry's been better catching the ball this year, which is super impressive, obviously. But the Titans defense does what they do, where it gets down to the goal line. They're on the one yard line, and they intercept the ball, and they stop the whole thing with six seconds left. Also, I don't know if that was a defense or the fact that Carson Wentz, Carson Wentz. Like, we've seen Carson Wentz wincing it up for years. It could have just been Carson Wentz. But I'm giving it credit to the defense to make me feel a little bit better here. Because the Titans are kind of a train wreck right now. And they have a bye week this week. And I hope they get it figured out. Yeah, Tannehill, 15 for 25, 181 yards, one touchdown. I don't want to hear about that, guy. Let's nah. move on. <laughs> well... You got to hear from a team. You, you, we talked about the beginning of the season, so you put in your boy Malik Willis. It's interesting looking at the game stats for this, Mitch, because the Commanders actually had their number in many categories. Commanders had 17 first downs, Titans at 15. Um, total plays, Titans at 62, Commanders at 58. Total yards, Washington had 395, Titans had 241. They both teams had 12 total drives. Passing yards, the Commanders had 342. And the Titans had 136, and then the, they had them beat in uh, rushing. Time of possession was 32-40 for the Titans and 27-20 for um, the Commanders. Uh, Wentz was 25 for 38 and 359 yards with two TDs and a pick. So it's interesting. They were they actually were in a position to probably win, but obviously didn't. And then Ron Rivera essentially threw. Carson Wentz under the bus and said, what's the issue? He said, quarterback. And then, of course, he fucking walked that back so he didn't lose the locker room. Um, turnovers, Washington had the one, so that, that may be, may very well have been what killed them. Um, but, I mean, just looking at the Titans, like, what is... You know, in the bye week, if you're if you're the if you're the in the the coaching room, if you're in the film room, what needs what needs to evolve? What needs to change for your Titans? Um, so with the yards, if you look back since Vrabel has taken over, there have been don't break offense. They will allow you to throw that 50 yard bomb, but they're not going to allow you to score once you get in within the 20. So the yards doesn't surprise me by any means because I've been having to deal with this for three years and it's really weird to deal with still. <laughs> but um, one thing I would like on the defensive side is more adhesiveness i guess um i don't think the defense knows what their assignments are yet and it's a young defense kevin byard is an elite safety but with that comes kevin byard doing byard things which means he's gonna run off the play whatever he wants and most of the time it works out but when you're a new defense they don't understand that and they need to learn their assignments so he can make up his own um on the offensive side Burks needs to get healthy, and two, they need to move the ball in the second half. They need to learn how to make adjustments. They can't be stagnant like this, where I believe the Titans have scored one touchdown in the second half this entire season. That's Whoa. it. Yeah. They need to learn how to make adjustments and adapt to it. Uh, Mitch, speaking of um, defensive woes and fuck-ups, how about my kitties? <laughs> Going in, going into Foxborough, getting absolutely outclassed by in Matt Patricia's fucking revenge game. By the way, Matt Patricia, a defensive coach, 
calling plays with Do- Joe Judge, two disgraced former head coaches. They shut out the kiddies. Swiss cheese secondary, injuries, fucking Dan Campbell calling plays like he's hopped up on Mountain Dew playing Madden with his friends. Um, I know what I could say about this, and they also have a bye week like your Titans. I don't know if they're on the brink of having to fire their DC. They do have to get healthy in the secondary, but regardless, they still had to bench uh, Awarie because I don't know what the hell's going on with the season. Jeff Akuda's kind of you know on an island. Tracy Walker, the safety, I believe, is out with the year for the Achilles injury. So it's it's a little bit of trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. But also, Aaron Glenn is just like loves to blitz, like no matter what the offense is giving him. But when you look at the kitties, I mean. What what kind of fucking duct tape do we need to get this shit together? Um, so you do need to fire your defensive coordinator because I'm like obviously you know my dad's a Lions fan, so I get stuck watching those stupid games. Also, um, <laughs> you need to fire the defensive coordinator. Also, T.J. Hawkinson needs to do better than one for four. He needs to be Rob Gronkowski. Like he can be, but somehow they need to give him the ball more, like Rob Gronkowski. Um, after that, you need a better quarterback than Jared Goff because he's going to Jared Goff it like he does every once in a while, which is this game. I don't hold this game against the Lions. I do find it funny that through the first four games, they scored 140 points and week five, they scored zero. Um, that's kind of the most Lions thing I've ever seen before. Pretty much. But, but really, like, the team's kind of got pieces, which is weird for Detroit. Like, they've got decent pieces out there on defense and offense. They need to fire their DC, and they need to... But also, they kind of need to keep sucking so they can get a real quarterback in there next year, and they can actually be really good. Well, true, but that but that's the interesting thing about, like, every every team with a rebuild is about where they're in, the, in, their, in their path, in their trajectory. But it, it, let's say Dan Campbell makes the season, assuming that, you know, Aaron Glenn may make the season or could get fired at some point during the season. Now you're talking about going into the third year and like, are they going to get if he still if he still has the locker room and, and they've made improvements that you can actually quantify, then Dan Campbell probably still has his job. If they win three games or less, then he probably doesn't have his job. But at the same time, we talked about it last week, how they have had a number one rank scoring offense where they've actually other than some of the, the clock management and the fourth down fourth and nine, let's go for it on our own 36 fuck ups. I mean, Jared Goff has been like slightly above average serviceable. And I think with this game is a bit of an outlier because I think, I think they're just the, their defense just completely let them down and completely affected the, the rest of the game and, and, and the rest of the team, because eventually when you're getting beat like that and there's absolutely nothing your defense can do to bail out the offense, eventually the offense is going to fold too. So we've seen that they've done good enough and, you know, Swift's out, you know, they, you know, they get Amon Ra back, but he couldn't really do anything in this game. So I, th- I would kind of chalk up offensively this game a bit of an outlier for them on offense. But you're right. Do I think we or the day is going to come to move off of Jared Goff? Absolutely. I mean, will it be the season? Who knows? Because who would it be like CJ Stroud, Bryce no, it's Young? Not the season. No. I mean, yeah. So I don't know if it's going to be this off season, right? So they may be better served to try to ultimately go the route, which they you, traditionally, as you know, with your dad being a Lions fan, they have always tried to build outside in. When they right. now have finally started building inside out, which is why their O-line has been so good when healthy, and they're definitely making strides in the D-line. Now it's like, okay, we have to get the we have to get the back seven right, and maybe then that day will come for the quarterback. But thank Christ they have a bye week because... Um, I was ready to play Dropkick Murphys and down a 12-pack of Guinness uh, because that's how much they fucking were driving me crazy last week. So there as you go. As a Titans fan, I do that every day. You don't do that as a Detroit fan? No. I'm just, I'm like, when you're a Lions fan, dude, it's like it's like you've been in rehab six times. You know what I, I mean? S- like, I, f- I, found, I found God and, like, I'm at peace. You know what I mean? Like, that's, you're like a heroin addict at that point. You know? That's how bad it's been. But... They have a bye week, so maybe they're maybe they're checking themselves in a fucking defense rehab. Let's <laughs> we'll see about that. Hey, Mitch, speaking of bad decisions, we're talking about our pattern production meeting. The Chargers survived the Browns 30 to 28 after a questionable fourth and a long run call by Brandon Staley. Um, 
this is a team that J- JB is like a, always will find a way to pick against the Chargers. And it drives me nuts. I know. I, but I got to be honest, like I sort of get why because like you want to talk about like a team that just fi- that finds the way to lose that still kind of lingers in the air for the Chargers. I mean, looking at them and looking at the Browns, I mean, what what did this game tell you about both of those teams? I'm big on in life in general consistency. And Brandon Staley, you know what you're getting with him. If it's fourth and two, if it's fourth and three, fourth and one, I don't care. We're going for it. Like, that's what it is. And some years you're going to be a higher percentage than others. Um, this year he's at 45.5% conversion rate. Last year he was over 60%. Sometimes it comes back to the means um, and everything like that. But I like the fact that Staley always goes for it. I don't think every coach should do it because a lot of coaches are following him right now. But if your identity, when you tell your bosses, we're going to be aggressive, we're going to do this, you tell your team every single week, we're aggressive, we're better than them, we can do this, you got to keep being consistent with your messaging. And I love the fact that Brendan Staley, win or lose, stands by it. Yeah, and I mean, you you know, you want to talk about pieces like kind of you were referencing with the kiddies. I mean, you know, the Chargers have excellent pieces on both sides of the ball and you know they have the quarterback whereas you look at you look at the browns and you know eh, i mean with yeah, Kobe Brissett, Kobe like, brisket yeah old, old brisket <laughs> i mean they you know they knew they knew what they were going to get into with that i mean you know he's he's 21 for 34 230 yards one td one one uh pick um but nick chubb 134 yards rushing. I mean, he averaged 7.9 a carry with two TDs. I mean, good God, if they didn't have him, I mean, this would be a fundamentally different um, team. I mean, just they're two and three. They're one and two at home. Just looking at their their schedule coming up, um, Patriots at Ravens, Bengals at Dolphins. And then so it's what Texans. Oddly enough, the Texans game is when Deshaun comes back. Right. That's after yeah, 13 totally it, weird who would have thought very weird um yeah. and it's going to be after a bye week so and then they got the they yeah then they have a stretch with the bills and bucks right before that so man I, I don't know i mean i guess like do you think they're really like kind of treading water like they hope to be by the time they get to the texans game um to me treading water would be one game over 500 i i don't think so I don't think they're treading water, but I think the Texans games make them. For the biscuit, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. the, the Texans make them tread. Yeah, I feel like they're. Gonna, I feel like they're going to come into that Texans game probably a game or two under five hundred. Is my prediction. Um, I mean, because they have some tough ones. I mean, Ravens, Bills, oh, yeah. Bucks alone are, are going to be probably. I don't know. I wouldn't say certain L's, but very close to certain L's. Um, Speaking of certain L's, Mitch, oh, the Ni- Ooh, Niner gang, they stomp out the Panthers in Carolina 37-15. to And Matt Rule, after two and a quota seasons, is fired after a 1-4 start. He won 11-27 and uh, for his career there. Um, a, do you think it was a good firing? B, do you think it was the right time to fire him? And C, what is your prediction about what college program he will immediately go to thereafter? Okay, so first off, how do you feel if you're the team that is the reason a coach gets fired? Like, you're just sitting there like, cool, we just stomped you, and then a team's so embarrassed that you stomp them. They're like, nope, he's fired. We'll never talk to him again. Uh, (laughs) But A, yes, it's the correct call. He should be fired. Hey, who do we got here? All right, Earl. Do you have Wi-Fi? Can we hear Earl? Can we hear Casual E? Oh my God, I'm, ki- I'm kicking you out, Earl. I'm bringing you back. No. All right. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Sean, that, that's been kind of the discussion about like the quick hook. Are we talking about two years? Um, so, all right. So, yeah, you bring up a good point, Mitch. How did you know being, being the team that is the reason why you get fired? But again, so, but, but the, again, the original question: um, Do you think at this point he should have been fired? Okay, yes, he should be fired. The interesting thing for me is B, he should have been fired last year when he was against the Giants, I think, and it was like fourth and seven, and he went for a QB sneak. 
I don't know the exact stats on this, but it was the dumbest play call I've ever seen in my life. And you should be fired for that play call alone. And he should have never been allowed to coach this season. Pretty bad. And then finally, what what college program do you think he's going to? Um, like is he going to Oklahoma after they fire Venables? <laughs> um, it's definitely going to be a team's going to pay him a lot. So I can't say anything around here. Um, Oklahoma, Nebraska be, might be in the mix. I will. I was just going to throw ASU out there to make oh, fans like God's super sake. excited, but ASU ain't going to pay him. ASU, so. bring back Earl. <laughs> hey, let's go, Earl. ASU. Oh my God, Earl! This nope, is no ridiculous. ASU. Um. I think isn't Wisconsin trying to hire right now? Yeah, actually, how how could I forget? They they fired Paul Christ. Um, I think Wisconsin and Oklahoma are both great options for him. Um, Wisconsin might be maybe not popular, but he needs a rebound tour. So Wisconsin would be great. I think to be if we're going to be honest, I think he's going to hold out to see if they fire Venables because if they do, you know they're gonna they're gonna back up the brink truck for him because the, the recruiting base will be better even though Wisconsin mm-hmm. gets awesome players i think he would probably have a better go of it you well, know with oklahoma so and i think that's go. why actually wisconsin would be better because we don't know it but their recruiting class is oddly super great like they can recruit yeah. every single year and i think he would get more credit for recruiting great even though they already recruit great just because it's wisconsin wisconsin put you in a wisconsin. mansion Oh my God! We can see Earl. Um, we can, hey Earl, we can see we What's can up? see your pixelated face. <laughs> can you hear us and see us? Oh my God, Earl, we love you. We're gonna have to kick you out of this again. All right, this is ridiculous, Earl. We love you. We got to keep trying. All right, and then finally, the roughing the passer madness, roughing up the game. Controversial calls with the Bucks, twenty-one to fifteen win over the Falcons and the Chiefs. That was a quite the barn burner, thirty to twenty-nine win over the Raiders. Um, First of all, what did you think about the actual calls, which many people did not like? And do you think that they affect, do you think each call affected the outcome of the game? Um, what my thoughts of the thing is kind of like, they're so overprotective all the time whenever there's media publicity over anything. Yes. And they're so scared of Tua happening all over again. So they have to overcorrect everything. And I'm not going to say too much of it because it's kind of the media's fault because they were so harsh and they got so scared that now everything's going to be back to being called again, which we hated, but we loved, but we hated, but we loved. So (laughs) I can't comment like too much of like, oh, I hate it. Like, I don't agree with them. But at the same time, we kind of asked for it. Like, we didn't know we asked for it, but we did. Um, In the Bucks game, I don't think it, like, I don't think it really change the outcome because I've watched Marcus Mariota play and besides that one playoff game against the Chiefs, I've seen him in two minute situations screw it up over and over again. I think they still would have lost. Yeah. Um for the for the Chiefs, I yeah, that was a bad call. I think it was a makeup call for a previous play, but I I think that did actually affect the outcome a little bit. Yeah, I, I you know I I definitely agree with you as far as like if we're, we're watching back the play here. I mean, Chris Jones, what he's supposed to do? I mean, he's take he's already taken him down, and th- th- that's the thing. Derek Carr, th- I think the biggest egregious thing wasn't the roughing the passer. Derek Carr was losing the ball as he was going down. So if anything, it was a fumble recovery by Chris Jones. And then this watching the back, it's like, okay, he swings him down because like he's not. You can't physic. You're not gonna be able to. Physics just dictate you're not just going to pull somebody straight down mm-hmm. like that. It's not going to happen. And again, if we're watching this back, the ball is coming out of Derek Carr's hand. So to me, it's actually a missed fumble recovery call. So well, that was the bigger bullshit thing that really affected it. But they still ended up the, out of there with the win. The worst thing to me is when you're watching that play, how many people are around him. He cannot sidestep because his 2.0. teammates are on another Brady roll. Because his teammates are right there, Raiders are right there. If you sidestep, you're going to cleat your teammate, and you do not want right. that by any means. So yep. I do 100% agree that it's BS, but at the same time, I can't sit here and ruin it because we're overprotective of quarterbacks because they'll be soft to us. And as much as I'd love to rip them, every time I rip them, the, the rules get even worse. So I'm yeah. just going to I'm just gonna the do the Marshawn Lynch. I'm just here so I don't get fined. That's right. Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. 
All right. Well, that has been some week five recap. And, uh, hey, man, you know what time it is. It is time for some Savage Picks. But before we get into Savage Picks, we got to see how JB and I have done through six, pardon me, five weeks of football. And with a drum roll, please, baby. Well, JB's at 42-36-1, and one, but yours truly is at 46-32-1, and one, baby. I'm taking a lead on these Savage Picks. Let's go through it really quickly. Uh, we both picked the Broncos to beat the Colts, and we both picked the Packers to beat the Giants in London, and I picked the Chargers correctly to beat the Browns. We both picked the Vikings correctly. We both picked my kitties who got stomped. We both picked the Bucks. JB correctly picked the Jets. We both picked Mitch's Titans. Both picked the Saints and the Bills. Both picked the Jags. They lost to the Texans, who snuck in before their bye week. I correctly picked the Niners. We both picked the Rams. I correctly picked the Eagles. We both picked the Ravens. And we both correctly picked the Chiefs. And guess what, baby? It's time for some motherfucking Savage Picks. Week 7. Cue the music. Let's go right now. Mitch, it is Thursday Night Football. It's the Commanders at the Bears. And the line is even. And JB's pick is the Bears. But who are you picking, good sir? Um, can I pick not watching this game and watching anything else because I'm not a degenerate? Do I really got to watch this game of the week? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> um, I will pick uh, the, the Bears because I don't like this. Yeah, I'm picking the Bears as well. Um, they have a, you know, they're going to do enough at home and there's going to be a little bit ter- too much turmoil in that locker room. Uh, with the whole controversy with Ron saying, basically saying flat out that they need a new quarterback. So I am going to take the Bears as well. Move right along. It's the uh, Skull Vikings at the Bermuda Triangle Dolphins, who are going to be starting Skylar Thompson, the third string quarterback. And the money line is 160 in favor of the Vikings. And JB's picks is the Vikings. But who do you got, Mr. Hughes? I was very confused at the Vegas line when I was looking at it because it's closer than I thought it was. I'm still going to do Vikings, but Vegas knows more than I do, and I'm scared. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, maybe Vegas is just counting on the weird Bermuda Triangle factor of when teams <laughs> go down to Miami and they find a way to fuck it up. And it is Kirk Cousins, after all. Mr. You, you do you have like to that? face the sun. Like, the sun is the number one pick every single year, and Miami gets it. So maybe that's what it comes from. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the Vikings, uh, Shawnee taking Miami. Okay, I'm taking the Vikings only for the simple fact that fucking Dolphins are down their third string quarterback. If they had Teddy two gloves in there, even, or even Tua, then I might be more inclined to pick the Vikings. But, uh, or the Dolphins, rather. But I'm going to take the Vikings. All right. Quote the Raven nevermore. It's a Ravens going into the hot. G man, and the line is minus two forty money line for the Ravens, and JB is taking the Ravens. Who are you taking, good sir? I'm going to take the Giants on this one. Ooh, a spicy meatball. That's bold of you. You do you ever do any, any particular reason? No, I don't want to have the same pig as you guys every single time. Oh. I just, I need, and I, I said I'm on the last show, I thought the Ravens were a bad team, and they barely you beat did. Other bad team who I thought they were really bad was the Bengals. I think Giants, while I don't think they're a good team, I think they're slightly better. Okay. that's a, you, You're making some interesting points. Uh, we shall see. All right. It's the patch. You go to the, to the Browns, and the line is minus 155 for the Browns at home. JB is taking the Browns. Who do you got, sir? I thought about making this my money-making pick, um, but the Vegas line was too close for this. I didn't agree with it either. I'm going with the Patriots because Vegas knows more than I do, and I don't like the line. Yeah, so it looks like um, it looks like uh, Mac is limited. I don't so I don't know if it's going to be Zappy again playing. Um, eh, I mean, I don't, I don't think last week's game is really saying much about what the Patriots can truly do on offense in in particular if they're still going to be without (laughs) Mac Jones they don't really have 
just really any weapons. And I think, you know, the Browns can do enough through Nick Chubb and make enough plays on defense. Um, so I'm going to take the Browns at home, bounce them back after a game that they probably should have won. All right, Mitch, speaking of your game, it's the Bungles taking on the Saints, and the line is minus 120 for the Bengals at home. JB picks the Bengals, and this is your pick of the week on the spread, the Saints plus 1.5 against the Bengals. Why did you make this money-making Mitch's pick of the week, good sir? The Bengals, I mean, Saints still have a great defense, right? And Bengals still have an awful offensive line, right? This is going to be Sack City. One of those sacks is going to lead to a huge interception late in the game. I don't care who the Saints quarterback is. They play it safe enough to go and limit opportunities. I think Saints can... This is going to be one of those boring games that you don't want to watch. And it's going to be low scoring, but they're going to win by a touchdown at least. So you, so if you're taking, so if you're a betting man taking this line, you're basically saying this could, this could be one of those type of games where the Bengals are out of rhythm. The Saints, obviously, which is who they have, aren't going to necessarily be like a, a barn burners on offense either. So this could be very well a situation where the Saints are just essentially winning by a field goal or better. I mean, given the line, right? That's kind of what Vegas is telling you. Is Vegas is one. Yeah, Vegas is telling me that. I would you be shocked, really, if Saints defense takes over and they win twenty-one to ten? Like, really, at the end of the day, would you be that shocked by that? Yeah, I'd be kind of surprised. I mean, twenty-one to ten. I mean, eh, I don't know. I mean, it just really depends on if they can stop the Bengals' firepower. But I'm taking the Bengals. But this is an interesting bet uh, in terms of on this particular uh, spread. So lock it in, folks. It's Mitch's money making pick of the week: the Saints plus. One and a half against the Bengals. All right. It's the ooh, Niner Gag. Ooh, going to the big dirty bird in the Falcons. The line is minus 240 for Frisco on the road, and JB is taking the Niners. Who do you got, good sir? Um, I really want to take the Falcons to be that guy, but it's definitely the Niners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm taking the Niners as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Falcons, are the, let's be honest, the Falcons are the tryhards this year. They're the tryhards. They're going to be like, oh, mm-hmm. you guys almost won, but you didn't because you're the fucking Falcons. So I'm taking the Niners. <laughs> and you got Marcus oh. Mariota. Oh, my God. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. It's the B-U-M-S. Wait a minute. Are, have they transformed back into the J-E-T-S Jets at Jets at the Packers? And the line is minus 350 for the Packers at home. JB's pick is the Packers. But who do you think it's, sir? Mm-hmm. I still got Packers. I still think they win this. I love what the Jets have done. I think this won't be their year, but I think they're actually... I can finally see something where they're building towards something. And I I think Green Bay does just enough for a money line bet, but um, if this was in New York, I'd bet New York. I'm going with delusional confidence, and I'm taking the Jets on the road to expose Green Bay's inconsistent defense and like roger rogers having a meltdown against his receivers and throwing microsoft surface tablets all over the place i love it i can't believe i'm doing I, this i'm taking the jets on the road to get a w i also have to say remember how much love i gave to sauce gardner over there and said he has to go to a new york team and sauce gardner's over there just dominating right now i am like i'm all in on Jets just because of that dude uh, yeah i mean eh. They're putting something together. I'm taking the Jets. Fuck it. I'm taking the Jets on the road. All right. It's the Bucks going to the Steelers. Uh, line is minus Bucks. 385. Yeah, Bucks immediately. <laughs> JB's picking the Bucks. I'm picking the Bucks. Let's keep it moving. All right. It's your division. Yeah. Move all Jaguars at the Colts. And the line is minus 135 for Indy. JB's taking the Jags. Took them last week. Your thoughts, um, sir? I feel like every time I watch a Jaguars versus Colts, it's 24-0 to at this point with Jaguars winning, and there's an interception that makes no sense in an end zone. That shouldn't be happening. Um, Jags are better than the Colts, and I keep seeing it historically, so Jags. I'm going the other way. I think the Colts win. I don't really have a great feeling about it, but only just because it's a home-and-away thing. I don't think any te- either team is particularly good, so I'm going to take the uh, Colts. All right. JB, cover your ears. Earl, cover your ears. Earl likes the Jets the other game, by the way, as he said in our chat. It's the uh-huh. Bird Gang headed to the Squawks. It's a matchup of the Boyds, and the line is minus 145 for the AZ Cardinals on the road. 
I like that you didn't say what JB's pick is because everybody already knows. Um, I agree with JB. So he would spend Cardinals. 10 minutes trying to convince us why it'd be the Cardinals. <laughs> I also have the Cardinals, though. <laughs> I also have the Cardinals as well. Uh, the Geno Smith train is going to stop at some point, and maybe this week is it. And like we talked about in Say the Bird Gang, look at what they do on the road. So we are all three taking the Cardinals. All right. It's a keep pounding Panthers. And Jay, uh, Earl says the Seahawks because they will get out to a 17-0 start. That's a great point, Earl. Uh, the, you, you, know, you know you're sad and you just hate your team when you think uh, Geno Smith is going to get to his 17-0 start. I know the woof. feeling, Earl. I'm sorry. I know the feeling. Woof. All right. Carolina here in L.A. The line is minus 455 for Carolina, who have the former Cardinals coach Steve Wilkes at the helm. Mr. Hughes, JB's taking the Rams. I am as well. So am I, mainly just because I think PJ Walker's their starting quarterback, right, this week. Like, I don't think Baker's playing. I guess. Woof. Yeah, we're all taking the Rams. All right. Game of the week. It's the Bills Mafia, Mafia at the Chiefs Kingdom, and the line is minus 125 for the Bills on the road. JB's picking the Chiefs. Who do you got, sir? I want to hear your answer first so I can argue it if you choose the opposite end. Eh, revenge tour. I'm taking the Bills. All right. So I'm picking the Chiefs mainly because White, Hyde, and Xavier Rhodes are out. And I feel like those are three key defensive players on that team. I'm just counting on Josh Allen to absolutely black out and spaz. Um, so I'm going to take the, the Bills. They're going to get revenge from whatever debacle happened in the playoffs when they let the Chiefs come back in and win in overtime. So there you go. All right. It's the uh, How About Them Cowgirls. Ding, ding. I mean, them Cowboys going to the E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles for Sunday Night Football. And the line is minus 235 for the Eagles at home. And the Bills have a lot to prove. You're right about that, Earl. Um, I'm tired of this Cooper Rush story. I freaking hope. Philadelphia kills the Cowboys. Like, I'm not even anti Cowboys as much as I am this year. I'm so tired of Cooper Rush thro- throwing for 100 yards and they say he's better than Dak Prescott. I hope he throws for 50 yards, two interceptions, disappears from the game. I'm tired of this narrative. I got Eagles. All right. I hate the Cowboys, um, but I think the uh, train for the Eagles stops this week. Micah Parsons no. making some plays, and I have the Cowboys no. going in there getting it done in the no. link, baby. That's right. I'm shaking shit up. And finally, some <laughs> Monday Night Football. It's the – it's a hang on, let me do, let me do an impression of Russell Wilson at the podium. Let's ride. It's a Broncos. That was actually way better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be so bad. That was great, actually. I think I actually kind of nailed it. Like he, like he you know, you know, he like knew he still needed to say because I would say his catchphrase, um, but he, 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 he didn't really want to say it because he knew that he was like things weren't good. He, he why couldn't it have been it. like? Why couldn't it have been like pony up? Like something that actually means something. <laughs> pony up, Russ. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> hey, listen, Earl's going hard in the paint in the chat here about the, the Cowboys defense. Uh, I don't know, man. That's a uh, well, hell of a Yes, thing. I mean, the Dallas defense has been great. They're the only team that has allowed multiple touchdowns this season um, in any single game. I don't think that can keep happening. I think Hurts is too multidimensional. And also, it doesn't matter. Like, I think Eagles can score 13 points, which would be one touchdown, two field goals. And I think Eagles are going to stop Cooper Rush. Like, I mean, Earl's got great points. I just, I think Cooper, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear Earl. I'm I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it either. I'm sorry, but... Earl. I don't want to hear from Cooper Rush. Anymore. I think it happens for the opposite reason. But quickly, so Broncos at Chargers. <laughs> JB's taking the Chargers. I'm taking the Chargers. Who are you liking this one? I got the Chargers. Stop putting Denver on the prime time games. Hide so them. bad. Because so bad. I'm tired. I'm tired of Denver as much as I am with Cooper Rush. I can't talk about this anymore. I'm going to just... <laughs> I'm well, before, never coming on the radio again. Oh, no. Before Mitch has a mental <laughs> breakdown, we'll see who's right, who's wrong, who's both right, who's both wrong. Bye weeks. My kitties. Thank God. Javon's Raiders. Mitch's Titans and the H-Town coming down Texans for the first bye weeks of the season. Uh, our thanks to our guy Earl for joining us from a frozen screen somewhere in the Phoenix Suns arena, dropping in stuff in the chat. 
we love you we'll make this work when you're back when you're back in the studio i promise you in the meantime this has been episode 233 of jb and benny blue review please follow us at jb and benny blue for all your social media needs again subscribe to our youtube channel all that good shit follow us individually 73 king jb 73 and myself at benny blue eyes again casualsports.com where you can find mitch's articles about the d-backs people talking about their fucking cardinals sons everybody there in the desert live streaming there and content right there out of the desert phoenix if you still want our podcast one dollar a month plus exclusive content patreon.com forward slash jb and benny blue and again any sponsorship new music hate mail titties from itch jb and benny blue review at gmail.com and that's it for money making mitchell hughes my name is benny blue jb will be back next week and until then we are out baby peace and love